Have you ever heard of a game called Two Truths and a Lie? It's a great icebreaker game for a group of people. Everybody takes a turn saying three statements out loud. Two of them must be facts about yourself, and the third should be a believable lie. You want to try to trick people, and everybody else has to guess which one the lie is. Imagine how good Lazarus would be at this game after Jesus raised him from the dead. His three could be these. Uh, I have two sisters named Martha and Mary. I like to swim, and one time I died. You got to be joking me. You can't have died. I, Father Kyle Poggi, have never died before. But Lazarus is different. He was able to say the opposite. I have died before. Now, I don't know if I'll ever be able to say that, but I do know one thing, that I'm also one day going to die. It's an inescapable fact. I have to consider, really, that I won't be here, likely, in the year 2100, which is too bad because I'd love to see my nephews and nieces' grandkids. I'd also like to be able to go to another planet and be the first priest to celebrate Mass there. But that probably won't happen. And it was true even of Lazarus that eventually, although Jesus raised him from the dead, he would die again. And that's why the teaching of Jesus today gives us Christians an indescribable and unshakable hope. He himself says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. How incredible is that? That even if we die in Jesus, we live forever. This means that death doesn't change our relationship with God. Our relationship with God changes death. We who believe in Jesus as Christ, the Son of God, will live forever. What a reason for indescribable jubilation and celebration, true joy. And there's no greater joy than we can have than to be assured in eternal life that comes through Christ. The usual passage that we're used to is from death to life. But in Jesus, we truly have this passage from, excuse me, in Jesus, we have this passage from death to life. You know, we're, we're so used to going from, from life to death. But in Jesus, that's totally different. Now, in this passage from death to life, Jesus says there's one thing in the middle. Belief in him. The question that he continually asks throughout this beautiful gospel reading is, do you believe in this? I am the resurrection and the life. And if you believe and live in me, even if you die, you will live. Do you believe this? And throughout the gospel, we hear that eventually those who had seen began to believe in him. And the gospel writer, John, that's his main purpose for sharing these stories, to encourage us also to put our belief in him, he who is the resurrection and the life. Now, many of us here believe in him. Many of us here are growing in our belief in him. And some of us here may be hearing it for the first time. Jesus is teaching that he himself is the resurrection and the life. Well, all of us should rejoice that this is true. This is the great grace that we have inherited in Jesus Christ. And this gospel even gives me hope in the, many, in the many ways that God wants to bring us to life. It's not just life after death, but even this life that we live on earth. Jesus wants it to be full of life. A wonderful saint, St. Irenaeus, said, The glory of God is a person fully alive. Doesn't that just give glory to God when he sees somebody who's just full of life? That's what the Lord wants for us too. He who is himself the life. Now, deaths that we can all experience include that of sin, misfortune, or broken relationships. Yet Jesus wants each of us to be alive. And that's why we must immerse ourselves in the Paschal mystery that is his passion, death, and resurrection from the dead. Because of it, death is like sleep to Jesus. It doesn't have the last word. 
and we can become fully alive to the glory of God while on earth. So I have two questions for our reflection today. And I want you to think of two people as I ask each question. One person as I ask each question. The first, whom do you identify as someone who lives life with belief in Jesus? Who is somebody in your life who he says, this person lives with belief in Jesus? And the second question Whom do you identify as someone who doesn't live life with belief in Jesus? Somebody who you know who doesn't live their life with belief in Jesus. Since we need to believe in Jesus, that stage in between death and life. How can we strengthen our belief in the Lord? How can we nurture our faith? Well, first to follow those people who have left such a good example of living their own faith and and belief in Jesus. Following the example of holy men and women throughout history, especially the saints. If you have a favorite saint or this person who comes to mind as you ask this question, this person who lives their life with belief in Jesus, what about their life can you emulate? Their life of prayer, their life of sacrifice, their life of loving others. And for the second person that you thought of, somebody who doesn't live their life with belief in Jesus, how can you bear witness to belief in Jesus to that person? Your life of prayer, your life of sacrifice, your life of love. How about simply inviting someone to Mass for Easter, a beautiful occasion, simply to invite somebody to see what it means to have belief in Jesus and in the resurrection. It's a beautiful way to share belief in him who is the way, the truth, and the life. As St. Paul said, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit dwelling in you. One day in heaven, we're all going to be able to play that icebreaker with Lazarus. And it won't be a secret that one of our truths will be this. I once died, but now I live forever and ever. Let us live these final two weeks of Lent, simply growing in joy that we have inherited the promise of eternal life. And let's share that joy with those whom we love. Good morning. Good morning. I've been recently reading a couple of different books by an author known as Romano Guardini. And in one of the books entitled The Lord, he has a marvelous chapter on the three different accounts of Jesus raising someone from the dead. And if you recall those events from Luke's gospel, there's Jairus who comes to Jesus, who has a dying child, a little girl about 12. And at one point, the messengers come to Jairus and say, don't bother the master, your daughter has died. And Jesus comes to the home and restores her to life. And then again in Luke's gospel, there's the widow from Nain who's lost her young man, young adult son. He's already now being carried to the grave. And Jesus stops the procession and places his hand on the bier, and the young man rises. And then today, we have Lazarus, a mature man, dead for four days, and we know the story. In each of these accounts, Jesus calls the dead back to life. In each of these events, something amazing happens. A life that is ended is renewed by Jesus as the Son of God. We hear these stories, these gospel accounts so regularly that sometimes they fail to really touch us. But the purpose of these accounts that truly happened 
is to renew our faith in Jesus as the Son of God, as the author of life. Gordini begins his focus by looking at the response of Jesus, especially in this resurrection of Lazarus. And we hear a number of times in today's gospel that Jesus was perturbed, that he groaned in spirit and he was troubled. And in the context where each of these moments come about, it's kind of strange. What does this mean? This repetition of being disturbed and troubled. And for Guardini, he says, in Lazarus's death, Christ foresaw his own death. And if he flung himself upon death to wrest from it the life of his friend, Lazarus. This cry that woke the dead in the tomb of Bethany reminds one of that other mighty cry of Jesus from the cross where Jesus again cried out in a loud voice in his own struggle. In the struggle with death for his friend's life, Christ himself wrestled with death, and his victory anticipated the triumph of his own resurrection. First, it is important to recall that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord of life. And when we think of the miracles that are recounted over and over again in the Gospels, this is always the starting point to come to know Jesus, not just as the Son of Man, but as the Son of God who was present before time began with the Father in creating everything. As I said, these biblical accounts can become too familiar and we can become too comfortable. But these miracle accounts of Jesus as the Son of God invite us to step back, particularly as we view the world around us today and our own comfort with the natural order, our own comfort with science, and to acknowledge how difficult it is for us to have some room for faith in Jesus to be alive and active in our world, in our life, in our circumstances as the Son of God today. Several years ago, as a young bishop, I had the opportunity to attend a conference at Notre Dame. And they've got this theater on campus. And they showed, with all of the new imagery of the universe that is now capable, they started with just a screen on the stage of the campus of Notre Dame. And then the picture just began to expand up and back into the universe. And the screen became the entire ceiling of this theater. And at one point then you draw back far enough that you can see Earth as a pretty significant part of the universe. But it just keeps going to the point where you can no longer distinguish where Earth is. It's just lost in the magnitude and the beauty and the vastness of God's creation. This is the natural order that God put into motion that still is in motion and still obeys the law of God. Ordini says that natural law is not interrupted in miracles, but rather 
At a given moment, it is forced to obey a higher law, a law that is absolutely realistic and significant. The world lies in God's hand. We are always in God's hand, even in the vastness of all of God's creation. God's relation to the world is not naturalistic, but is always absolutely personal. Through his son, Jesus. So what is the purpose of these miracles of Jesus? What is the purpose of the resurrection of the little girl, of the young man, of Lazarus? Especially when we know that people continue to die and suffer and struggle today. When we pray to God for such miracles that seemingly go unanswered. The purpose of these works of Jesus is to strengthen our faith in him and to make clear what the true reality is of the world, that we are in the end subject to the Lord of life, to whom death is also subject, to whom all of God's creation is subject. And every one of us, strengthened by faith, can and should have confidence in the fact that each one of us are precious in the eyes of God. More precious than all of the rest of creation. For God, with the vastness of the universe which he created, each person is the center of God's world. In the gospel, we read during the weekday at Masses this week, or read at the Masses this past week, Jesus spoke to the importance of belief in him, belief in the works that he did, and the signs that he performed. As he said, the works that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. And he goes on to say something even more significant, especially for our days. When the world is flat, because we just expect things to go according to nature, where science is the God of our world. And Jesus challenged the people of his time, and I think he would say the same thing in the world today to many. You do not want to come to me to have life. In these accounts in the gospel during the Lenten season, Jesus is making it clear that it is only by coming to him that we truly have life. It is only before him that death will surrender. And life, the very life of God, will be extended to us. Lent is precisely the time for us to think about the areas of our own life where we do not want to come to Jesus for life. Where we do not want to invite Jesus to be our life. The easiest way to discover what those aspects of our life might be is to simply and honestly admit the things that we do that leave us feeling empty. The things that we do that make us taste the death of sin. These are precisely the areas we need to allow Jesus to touch us. To bring us back to life. Life in him. Another way of looking at it. Being aware of those very moments that trouble us in our lives. It's important to hear the word of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. But not just as an outward story that we hear this morning. But rather 
hearing these words of Jesus deeply with inside of us, deeply personal. I am the resurrection and the life. Hear them within, speaking personally. Jesus wants and longs and desires to conquer death. St. Paul spoke of it in the second reading. That life of Jesus that conquers this death. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the resurrection. And he is speaking to you and to me personally this day. To our present circumstance of life. Whatever our situation and reality is. To draw us out of fear. To draw us to faith. To draw us to life in him.